Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Welcome, Prashant, to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. Can you tell us a little about yourself? Uh, hi, thanks, Ryan, for inviting me to your amazing podcast. Um, Prashant Pandey. Currently, professionally, I work as um, Director of Technology in VMware for Asia Pacific in Japan. I am a author, technologist, and a mentor. I help customers to build future of work so that their productivity, profitability, and security increases. Uh, today, I'm very really excited about um, talking about the book with you. Um, so, your, so your book is, is The Future of Work. Is, is this your first book? Corporate-wise, yes. It's first book, but before that, I have written some white papers in colleges, but those don't qualify for a book yeah. that was on Amazon. Yeah. No, sure, sure. Great. So, do you want to tell me a bit about how you got to the to writing the book, the sort of the, the history? Sure. For last eight years, I was talking to customers across um, Asia Pacific and Japan, which is 58 countries, on how to transform their work style. And then unfortunately, two years back, what I was talking to became very relevant. I started getting a lot of calls. I started getting into customer meetings and I started seeing a change which we have been sharing. So I had a challenge in front of me that how do I scale myself? Shall I write code or shall I write book? And that mm-hmm. dilemma led me to an answer that I should write a book so that more people can read it and get benefited from it. Because by 2050, people will not work the way they have been working for the last two decades. Um, and that's the start of the book. Okay, great. And um, you, you mentioned that the, that that you did you say fifty eight countries in Asia. Did I must hear that? Yes, fifty. I didn't even know there were fifty eight countries. I mean, that shows how little I know. Um, what what was the most common challenge that that your customers asked you about? There are two parts. First is if you say a customer, they are always concerned about um, cost of buying technology. Right? And that needs justification mathematically. However, the more relevant question with uh, people who were focused on people and the strategy was experience. Someone like you, you have been talking to customer and people, you understand that there are change agents uh, who really want to change things so that it's easy for people to work. For example, when I was working with a university, there was a very nice gentleman, forward looking, who said, I want to build a university where students can work from anywhere. And for me, that's of a higher order value. However, mathematically, it's always the cost which comes into conversation. But underneath both, quality is the key. Because mm. so, that's what I was going to ask you. When you said experience, you, do you mean the actual delivery of the for the person to actually be able to do their work? Um, yeah, that's one dimension of yeah. uh, looking at things from the corporate side. But when you look at the same question from human side, each one of us are bringing our personal consumer experience. I'll give you an example. Mm. Today, when you're in Johannesburg and you have to change your phone, simple, you go to shop, you give your phone, you take a new phone, yeah. key in your email address, you start working. However, how many organizations are able to deliver that? So someone like you, when you go join an organization and you ask them, I want the same experience like buying a phone from a shop, that becomes hard. And that's the mm. viewpoint of the same experience. Yeah, you see that big hesitation. <sighs> yeah, we can't do that for you so quickly. There's yes. 25 forms you've got to fill in and 10 processes you've got to go through and 100, 100 approvals. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so how do you, I mean, do you go in there and, and, and help with the transformation of a business from um, almost like what I've just explained as, as, the, as the chaotic bureaucracy bureaucratic at least environment, uh, or you're just consulting at a, at a high level? I mean, what's your sort of role in these things? I would say um, both because it's a lot driven by organization. Uh, and pretty much if you look at organizations, they are in two types um, of a step curve. Few are leading and few are lagging, but lagging because of their size and age, mm-hmm. right? So when you go in each of these organizations, the first thing 
is to understand the vision, what your vision is, which is slightly different. So I try to understand their vision, then the vision has to be realized. So as a second step, I try to give them a journey map, how they can start from somewhere and reach somewhere, and what are the milestones of the journey, how they look like. And the third step is a bit of a demonstration of technology. Sometimes you get the team along where they set up their, um, their dream, how it will look like, so that they can feel it, and then they start on the journey. So pretty much this is a cycle of uh, attaching to the vision, drawing their journey map, and third is realizing their dream by really bringing technology together for that. It's Yeah, because I'm, I'm reading the, the sort of profile of your book here, and you talk a lot about feelings. Yeah. Have you just sort of, have you applied something like behavioral economics into your thinking, or is it is it more simpler than that, I guess? No, you're right. Um, behavior economy, um, very interesting word. I like it. And Historically, economy has a lot of depth on technology, to be honest. And I'll give you, it all started when we all had BlackBerry and our behavior started changing when we started seeing the red blip. And if you go the technology side of that blip, um, it was driven by something like Captology, where technology was actually changing human behaviors and the science started in 1990. However, both of us as a user of the technology never realized that our behaviors are changing. And now after 40 years, it's part of our life to a point mm. that if you talk to a kid who is nine years old, he or she feels that Wi-Fi is the reality, like oxygen, mm. and yeah. the world works on iPad, and that phenomenon yeah. is going to grow in future. Not even, not even, not even nine years old. My, my three-year-old, um, as much as I mean, one of the benefits of being out in Joburg is that he can play outside all the time. So he does play yeah. outside all the time compared to when we live in the UK. Um, but by the end of the day, he's tired. And then he says, I'm t- I've played the whole day. Can I have my phone? Can I have your phone to watch YouTube? And you're like, uh, you're three. You shouldn't be worried about this kind of stuff. But he wants to watch his little cars that he likes on YouTube. It's the only place he can get it. So he's figured out that that's where he can get it. And, and he's now f- he's smart enough to realize that he's he, he's got a little bit of, of a logic thing where he knows that if he's played outside the whole day, that he, he's allowed a bit of TV. Yes. Um, now, if I could put YouTube on the TV, which he's okay with. He's happy that that meets the thing. But he still likes the tactile thing about holding the phone or holding the little iPad that he can use and press the buttons. And it's so intuitive. And back and stop. It's crazy. It's, it's intuitive, crazy. right? I mean, if you look at us, when we went to we went to school for the first time, there was a pen and paper, and somebody taught us how to write A, B, or at least um, keep the book in the right shape yeah. and order. Look at the kids. The iPad works from any dimension till the time you can see yeah. the screen. Um, perhaps I'm not sure if you taught them ever to click, but it comes automatically naturally to them. Mm-hmm. And and that's the generation. I'll give you some data point. For example, India right now has um, 750 million people who are under 30 years of age. And sure. that gives you a sense that if you just look at extrapolation of that to whole of Asia, there are 4 billion people. And the way the generation is changing, the work style will change because when our kids are coming to work, they're certainly not going to look at um, paper or pen or experience where somebody's teaching them. They'll be intuitive, they'll be creative. And for them, yeah. technology has to be an enabler so that they can put their true self out and let the world enjoy that. Yeah, no, I think, and I think a part of that is, and, and YouTube plays a big part in this. If you want to learn something, the content yeah. is available for you to learn something. Even my, my 70 something year old uncle, and he's very young for a 70 year old, says, if I want to learn something, I go on YouTube. I don't, I don't go to school anymore for, I don't go to, you know, he's a mechanical guy. So he doesn't go, he doesn't go to a mechanic to do something for him. He'll find the article or the, sorry, the, the, the video on YouTube. He'll watch that. He'll fix the thing. And then when he goes and has a conversation with the mechanic, he's going in 50% more informed because he obviously knows enough now to have a conversation with the mechanic. So he feels more empowered. And I think that's what these, these youngsters are. When I say youngsters, you're, you're sub 30 are feeling is that they, they can learn anything because the content says they don't have to memorize it, but they're because they, they are, it's available to them. They can utilize it. Yeah. Um, and the technology is helping them to do that. Yes. And um, you are absolutely right. Uh, Ryan. Uh, tech, the new generation will apply the science which is there. 
and they can apply it because they can consume it quickly. But if you look at the consumption way, how it has changed is a three-step process. For example, the first way was books were written on paper and, 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 and leaves. And the only way you can learn was reading. Then evolved the science when radio came and people could listen to the same book or same speech or same poem mm -hmm. and, and, and they can consume things. And then the third step was both of them combined together with a visual and hence came the place where YouTube is there. So the good part is each one of us as a consumer have the freedom now, whether you want to read, whether you want to listen, you want to see, and you choose the yeah. best thing. Like look at this podcast, you will preferably choose an audio mode because people can comprehend quickly when they listen. However, it's certainly more valuable if you put the same thing in a subtext or you put the same thing in a video form also so that your audience base becomes broader. So that's the world where technology will allow everyone to share their learning in any mm. possible way. Yeah. No, you're so right. And I mean, to answer your question about my son, he, we never taught him how to press buttons on the screen. He, he figured that out. But to the point that when he started walking, he would walk up to the TV and put his finger on the TV yeah. to see if the TV would do stuff. Yeah. And I think that's the amazing thing is that, is that the, the learning through doing is, is so much more accelerated now. Yeah. Um, and we're also doing things with, with my daughter. She's only one. If she's going to watch TV, she's watching something in another language with captions on. Wow. She's watching cartoons. You know, so, so all the stuff is visually there. Okay, look, she doesn't spend a lot of time on the TV. But, but if, she's, if we are going to do it, then we, we're, we're definitely trying to make it an educational thing. And I think through the lockdown, we wouldn't have survived if we had both kids at home locked up without, without having some sort of digital medium to entertain the kids as well as educate them because, you know, what, what else are you going to do? Um, so I think the, the, the future is, is interesting from that point of view because the technology is so, so valuable to us that if we had to take it away, I think we'd all be lost, um, for want of a better phrase. True. And you, you're absolutely right. And, and you, when you said language, that was a very powerful construct. Because if you see language was all, the, the knowledge was limited by language, right? In terms of the way it was written and in terms of it was getting consumed. For example, when I go to Japan, I see amazing set of engineers. They're very ingrained into technology. They are one of the community who have built electronics from ground up. However, just because the language is not enabled by technology where on runtime, we can translate Japanese to the other part of the world and vice versa, it adds a lag. And I feel that's the area where a lot of advancement will happen um, so that mm -hmm. people can cross collaborate by gesture, by video, by voice across language so that they are talking to the same purpose. Imagine both of us doing this call and I'm speaking in Hindi and you're speaking in English, but the world can understand and listen that in French, English, or someone in Africa can listen to this in their native language. How powerful that will be. I think there's a way to go, but that was a very important construct. I like that. Well, when you say that, I think, I think we're not far from that. Um, I think you could get, um, and if you look at some of these services out there, uh, what's the one that I use? Otter is one that I use. There's another one called um, Disparis or Disperse or something. And they do real-time trans uh, transcriptions now of video. And I mean, obviously, you know, Teams and Zoom and all these things also do real-time transcriptions. We're not far away from that being able to give you a, a, a fairly accurate, let's not, say not, let's not say perfectly accurate translation to another language. Um, because, you know, at this point in time, they still struggle with picking up accents versus uh, words that sound very similar. Um, so, so your transcripts are not perfect. They're probably, you know, 60% there. You still have to go clean them up. But, I, you know, if you're just trying to get the gist of the conversation, um, it's very possible, right, I would say probably now, to get another language being translated as you talk. Now, down to specific dialects, I think that's where it gets interesting when India has got many dialects. Um, South Africa has 11 official languages and there's probably 15 or 20 other dialects that we don't even talk about that exist. So, so that complexity, I, I can definitely see there being issues. But um, I mean, I remember reading something not too long ago, I think Duolingo, the, the language app, yeah. um, 
they were talking about their next version being an app that's deployed into the AirPods, and you could you could hear someone talking, and they would give you the they would do the translation while they're talking through the AirPods. Um, yeah. Which. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, so one thing I also do is um, pro bono consulting um, with the startups, many startups who are trying to do things. And you are right that this technology has been there. However, it hasn't reached a stage where enterprises are using them and not using interpreter in a meeting. So mm -hmm. is it there? Yes. Is it good enough? Not sure. Um, how long it's going to take. It's a factor of um, how quickly they can get better at the taking feedback and improving their products. And that's part of getting better is getting slow by the fact that it takes a lot of resource to improvise the quality. And that's where I think there's a scope of something like digital twin or some um, AI based mechanism, which can actually check the context and syntax and semantics of a language so that it can prove that the mm. voice or the context of the message is 98% right. Um, so I, I have seen few apps which actually can measure my voice, my feelings, but still they are very nascent, I would say. And mm. I'm very happy if by 2025 both of us are talking uh, on this call and we can understand each other without using any interpreter in any two different language. So I feel it's a long journey well, still. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, it, it, it's one of those, I mean, at least because people are building it now, if there's prototypes already, that shows that there's an appetite. So maybe it is two years away, maybe it is 10 years away, but it's still close enough that we may see it. Um, when, when you look at, at the startups that you speak to, I mean, how do you decide if someone, if there's, a, there's an idea worth mentoring or, or consulting with? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because I saw three type of startups. Um, the first startups were very sharp in terms of what they're trying to solve and how long it's going to solve and how much money it takes to solve the problem. And those are the one who became kind of a unicorn. The second one were the one who were more focused on giving the business pitch, but their vision was just limited for two years. Because if you ask them, what after two years, they can't see. And that was a clear indicator that they're looking at a very small problem. For example, the voice problem. If you talk to some startup and say, what do you want to translate? They're like, okay, we want to translate English to Japanese. That's it in two years, right? So that's a limitation. And the third startup, which is which is seen 80% of the time, is focused on technology. If, if it's a technology mm -hmm. startup. Or if it's a mechanical engineering, they focus a lot on 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 say, their core engineering part. And history has been um, uh, history has shown us many times, right? The people even who have built Tesla now have had history where they were very focused on technology side, but they didn't realize the consumer side. And that's the piece I was talking about. That how empathetic you are to your customers. Do you really go and listen to them carefully? Um, and then you change your product rather than sitting in a room making your wishful thinking of creating a roadmap and making a right mm -hmm. product. So, so that's yeah. what my observation of startup has been. And I'm pretty much open to all three of them because when I tell them, um, I tell them that you simply have to listen to your customer and quickly adopt that feature or solution in your offering and then churn on it as soon as possible so that you're delivering value to customer and you're getting better every day. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a level of that listen to the customer being, I don't want to say cliched, but you've got to, you've got to actually interrogate the customer a little bit. And, and yes. I'm, not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about inquisition, but you know, a customer might tell you a lot of things, but unless you're actually asking them questions and trying to understand where they're coming from, yeah. you could end up with, 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 with nothing valuable. Um, sometimes it's, it's the twenty percent that they say that actually the important stuff. You're just going to find that twenty percent. Um, do you do you teach the, the sort of people how to to do that? I mean, when you, when you get involved, I mean, how how deep are you involved in consulting to a startup? It's pro bono, as I said. Um, so mm. I have I I I I invest my say weekends once or twice in a month uh, with okay. them for an hour. 
And um, outside that, I am part of a community where I go and talk to them casually on what startup they're trying to build and how we can help them. Um, but I'm not actively mentoring a startup from end to end because mm. of my job role right now. Um, I have a full-time job, which just drains my body <laughs> 50 hours uh, a week. And after that, I, I can't commit more. So I just try to be sure. realistic. Yeah. No, sure. Um, so, so how did you find time to write a book? Yeah, that was an interesting um, thought because when I started conceptualizing, to me, it clearly came as it's an enduring thing rather than easy sprint. So I looked at the whole year. This was beginning of February 2020. And then I thought if I look at the whole year, it becomes 54 weeks. And now almost eight weeks are gone. So I'm sitting somewhere on 50 weeks. And even if I write one chapter per week, I will land around 50 chapters. However, I spent again three, four more weeks to just structure the framework of the book. For example, um, the section on purpose, the section on strategy, the section on challenge, the section on feelings. And that gave me a shape or framework of a structure which I need to fill. And then I fill the headlines of the chapter. Now comes the interesting part. How do I write? Because I need clear brain. So every Thursday morning, I used to go for a ride, a bike ride, and there was two hour ride. And that was my time to think because I had mm -hmm. put a calendar where I said every Saturday morning, I will just wake up and I will fill one chapter um, whose structure was ready. So that became a cycle and I started writing and eventually somewhere around next January, I was sitting at 37 chapters. Um, but that's how the whole thing came together. Okay. And um, I mean, I haven't read your book yet, obviously. So is, is it how many chapters do you end up with? 37 37 wow yeah okay and 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 if someone were to, to go buy the book now i mean what, what would be the the key thing that you're trying to get across see the purpose of writing the book was to help people to build their future of work so that they can be productive or they can be uh, efficient right and in that context, uh, it depends who picks the book. For example, I was talking to a few students from university and they got value from this because they got an idea of what are the challenges which exist in the, in the community. Then I was talking to a few people like you who have done transformation and are, have been advisor to people on transformation. They like the section on feeling and execution a lot, uh, especially mm -hmm. on the tool side. And third is a set of people who are who have questions, but they need consultants to get answer. For example, very senior executives who are crunching time, but they need some pointed structures to get answer for their strategy. And that's why they like the section on a strategy because I have talked about things like sustainability as a goal or green as a goal, how that can change the whole organization. So it depends who picks the book, but pretty much anyone who is looking at building their future of work will get benefit from this book. Okay. And, and you took a structure where you, you, you went through the challenges and you went into f to feeling and focuses. Um, wh what are you do? What are you providing in the sense of strategies for people in the future of work? Is it, is it down to tactical level or more holistic? Holistic. Um, for example, um, you know, the elephant, right? So there's a famous story that, if you send five people blindfolded to, 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 to feel an elephant and then they come back, you ask them, how was the elephant? So someone will tell you uh, elephant is a tail or elephant is a trunk, elephant is a leg, <laughs> right? So it's very similar stuff where I look at future of work from all the angles and then try to cover that in book. And what those five angles were, I looked at the challenges of future of work, which was one angle. The second angle was the structure of the organization of future of work how it evolved and how it's changing. The third was the tools which will be there in future of work. The fourth one was the feeling of future of work, which doesn't get accounted and designed often. And the fifth part is the strategy part of future of work, because at the end, every organization has a purpose. If that's not clearly defined, the organization doesn't survive for ages. Mm. Um, so those are the five aspects of 
work which are captured in the book. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you do work in Japan because one of the things that I've noticed about Japanese businesses, they tend to plan in hundreds of years, not in quarters and, and years like the rest of us do. Is that something that you've, you've come across as well or, or not? Yeah, I admire that a lot. And it took me three years to get my Japanese name, Aki-san. Um, my colleagues yeah. in Japan gave me that name. I'm very proud of that name. Um, however, the learning that came to me was quality. Yeah. Um, and there is a saying that cost is long forgotten, but quality is still there when you are not there. And I think that's the, the that's whole. A point. Uh, thank you. And that's the whole um, learning that I had in Japan, where if you have to build quality, you have to really step back, go to a whiteboard, think what you're trying to do, then do a prototype, and then scale it. And You'll be surprised that um, the biggest of the VDI markets are in Japan. Um, nobody knows that, right? Um, the biggest of the transformations are in Japan in terms of robots. Um, yeah, we have a hotel next to our office, which is fully robotic. You will not have a single human really? who will service you. Wow. Yeah, you walk in, and that will be an amazing thing. You walk in the hotel, there is a receptionist who is a robot. Um, he or she will help you check in and you do a seamless experience. The door is electronic, go in the door, inside the door. Um, the whole room has electronic buttons. There will be a robot serving you and then you go in your washroom. Um, the toilets are world famous. Um, so they really take technology to give you feeling. And if you look, if you just split it apart, you can understand how complex it is. It's not very easy. It's all electronics. It's all sensors. It's all software mm. which all comes together for a long-term growth but i think is that's that, what the world should look from japan and learn from them is that the the, the hayden uh, hotel in nagasaki i can't recollect the name but my hotel uh, my office was in um hamamatsu which is uh, two stop from tokyo and this hotel is just behind um, our office in uh, hamamatsu Okay, well, it's, it looks like they have more than one hotel. <laughs> there are there are robot yeah. restaurants, there are uh, robot hospital, uh, wow. hotels, and and there are games also. People play a lot of games using robots. Mm. Um, they're very famous for. But that's the land of experience or zen of experience, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you say you got your Japanese name. What does that actually mean? When you say you got you got your name, did you have to earn it somehow? Yeah, the name is uh, Aki, Aki-san. So san is a suffix, which is um, a symbol yeah. of respect. Aki literally means autumn. However, the name comes from Akio Morita, who is the founder of Sony. So the story goes like I was sitting with my friends, um, the whole colleague from Japan. And we were celebrating yeah. our success after three years. And they said, Prashant, your name is good, but we want to give you a name. And I was like, sure, you should. And and then they said, you choose your name because they are very humble and polite. And I said that um, that's a hard thing because before this, I got baptized. Um, so this is my <laughs> second life and he <laughs> baptized me. And they were like, no, you have to choose your name. So I said, okay, I'm an electronics engineer. I read a book about Akio Morita, who founded Sony. And I, if you're not ready, you should read the book because it's all about how digital electronics radio got created and how Sony became uh, what it is. Um, so I said, if you can give something related to Akio Morita, uh, it would be an honor. And thankfully, the whole team collaborated, discussed, and honored me with a name called Aki which I proudly own and try my best to uh, keep myself to the name. That's the story wow. behind my name, Aki-san. Yeah. That's brilliant. What was the name of the book for Sony? Sorry, I'm just looking on, on Amazon at the moment. Uh, it's called Sony. Let me check. Uh, Akio Morita. And yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of books on taking photography, if you type Sony. Sorry, the book uh, is called Made in Japan. Made in Japan. Yeah. Made in Japan. Okay, I'll put that in the links as well. Oh, I have, I have seen this book. I haven't read this book. Have you read it? No, I've seen it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I buy a lot of books, and, and uh, I've definitely seen this one as one to buy. Um, I will put this in my notes so that it's on the list. 
Definitely. Yeah, the whole evolution of how uh, voice can be can be transmitted far using the best of technology. It starts from there and then goes into a story of how you take the technology outside to the world and make something as big as Sony, which exists for hundreds of years, I would say. So I lost my train of thought now in Japan. We are talking about books uh, in Japan. Yeah, so yeah well, I still haven't been to Japan. It's, um, it's, it's on my list of places to go. And uh, obviously with, uh, with COVID, not, you know, people aren't traveling major distances. Um, but uh, it's, it's, you know, I've heard good things about it. I mean, were you based there for three years or were you just traveling from Singapore to Japan and back? Um, I travel from Singapore to Japan. However, Asia is really um, culturally rich and um, interesting. Mm. So have you, have you got a chance to spend some time in this part of the world? I have. My, my dad worked for an airline. So I, I traveled a lot to Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I, I did, did one trip to Malaysia. So I, so I know sort of the areas, if you like. Um, I've always had a had a, a fascination with with the area, and I, and I would love to. I loved. I would love to live there still. Um, maybe maybe I will in the future. Who knows? Yes. Um, what was your observation on um, direct versus indirect communication? Because if you see there are, on a scale, there are two sides of the world, right? One is very direct; you can go and ask and get things, and the second one is indirect, where you don't understand the context, you don't understand the whole gimmick behind what the question is. And that's what Asia is all about, where you have a mix of both. Mm. Did you did you feel that in your conversation with people or business or? Yeah, so, so I found Hong Kong very much a direct place. Um, and that was pre, pre coming, going back to the Chinese and, and then post going back to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, Thai, I found them to be a lot more indirect, um, and I guess it depends on on where you are, where you are in in those places. Um, Singapore, I can't really remember because that was probably the that's probably twenty years ago wow. uh, that I was in Singapore. It's um, changed a lot since then. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you know, I was hoping to get there this year, but but uh, that hasn't happened. Um, but but I hear what you say. But but I find that's a general thing now, even in Europe and in the UK. Um, yeah, the, the America is very direct still, so you don't see those sort of things. But but Europe, you can you can have a very indirect conversation. You can do a lot of lobbying, a lot of networking to get something decided on. Mm. Whereas in America, I found that to be pretty direct. Now in Europe, depending on where you were, you know, you would have either very direct conversations or you'd have the indirect ones. So so you could let you be. You know, between the border of where you are. I mean, when I worked for for one of the banks, we had guys in Germany and Switzerland and um, and France, and just between those three people, you would have a combination of indirect and direct. Yeah. Um, which 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 makes it uh, interesting, let's say. <laughs> yeah. So I what um, that conversation was because I thought a lot of that. Um, topic when, when I was writing the book and there's something called center of action. So historically, as you write, when you, okay. the world evolved, um, there were places like London or Germany where actually the decisions were taken and people used to come to center of action so that they can be part mm -hmm. of the decision and then change the world with goodness. However, over a period of time, as yeah. people started connecting, as, as you rightly said, uh, places like Hong Kong, Singapore became places which were connected. And um, they were also the new evolving center of action. But if you just extrapolate that to the whole world, I think there is no one place now which is center of action. And that's what I have been talking or thinking of location limit, that you don't have to be at the center of action or place where you're bounded by location and that's where the decisions are happening. You can be in Johannesburg, I can be in Singapore, and we can come on a call and quickly decide that, hey, let's do a podcast though we haven't yeah. talked to each other and yeah. tomorrow we'll post this podcast on this and then people from the world can um, hear and listen it and experience it. So that's the agility, which is there in future of work and um, the world is moving. And I think there will always be cultures where direct and indirect things will be there. However, there will be a median somewhere uh, when the language can be transcripted across and the digital platform will let people work and decide quickly so that, they can be effective and efficient, I feel. 
No, I think you're totally right. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite weird to still see um, some some people are being forced back into offices and and that sort of thing. Um, but I think that's more of a control issue than, than anything else. But I think you're right. I think the amount you should be able to hire anyone across the globe now for a role, not yeah. be geographically restricted like you were before. Um, and also it should become more results orientated um, instead of, of nine, nine to five shift work, which is the old factory mentality. Yes. And, and you are absolutely right that um, uh, the cause of this effect is um, because the world was designed like that. When we started working, yeah. we thought that people will come to office and then we'll feel they are working, whether you can't measure the productivity or experience. On the contrary, when you gave example of your uh, kids, um, yeah. they will evolve in a world where, or, or look at the school, they they don't go to school to just do their homework or, 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 or a maths. They are connected mm. on an iPad. Um, they have an outcome-based uh, study course, like you can go and do higher algebra, you can listen to four poems, and you are good. <laughs> so that's how yeah. I think the challenge is on uh, the productivity side, that if you can't define outcomes, you can't create a small team around it, and you can't give them a goal which can be translated into success rather than just becoming the old way of uh, doing clinical and mechanical work, which machine can do easily now. Well, that's it. And, and the old schooling system, which hasn't been changed in almost 150 years, is is so designing you for a a, a factory lifestyle. And I think we, we have to move past it to, the, to a, whatever the new, you know, call it knowledge worker, call it whatever. Um, and kids, kids need to go to school for social aspects. I mean, you know, one of the biggest reasons why we're still in Joburg is my yeah. son goes to school with a, with a, with another 50 kids, he's not in a bubble. Um, and they're all different ages. So he's getting exposed and you can, and I can see how he's developing because of it, mm. but he's, he's learning and he's learning stuff there, the right kind of things, how to paint, how to build things, etc. Um, but when, as he gets older, you know, that, that social element is the important piece. The actual education piece, learning how to read and write was probably the next piece. The rest of it will come as he needs to learn it. You know, it, it, I think this, the, 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 the sort of Montessori approach where they learn something and they get and they get, keep developing on it until they run out of interest on it is kind of the way we would probably go. I mean, I don't know if it's good, if it's the best thing, but at this stage, it seems like the most logical. Yeah, right. And if you see why we need to socialize is because of empathy, right? Um, that's a piece where science hasn't focused a lot for ages. Mm. And yeah. um, that's the piece which we naturally learn when we're in social setup. We try to feel how others are feeling like they are they feeling good, bad, um, sad. Yeah. Um, each one of us are going through that emotions. However, coming back to your point of a schooling system, a schooling system was always built to create people who could work. For example, and I've written that yes. in my book, um, as you have spot on 100 years back, the world wanted a lot of people who could um, do mathematical calcul calculation on how many cars are being shipped. And they needed a lot of workers who could go and make those cars. And if you had to yep. create that workforce, you need a school which teaches you math and which teaches you a, a bit of um, science, I would say. There was not a school which te taught everyone dance or music or how people are feeling. Mm. Um, and that's why we don't have many great orchestra players or many guitar players or many piano players. But do you think that world should not have? World should certainly have. And I feel yep. the future of work will change where I would like to go to a, a website called, say, Masterclass, where I can go and learn how chess is played. Or my wife does a startup uh, where she um, is making designer cakes, boutique cakes. So she can go and share what she has learned. And people who want to learn um, creative art will go on a digital platform and will learn that and then share that. And that will be their career. So I think the, the world school will evolve for all 8 billion people. Certainly supported by a digital platform. Yeah, no, that's it. And I think one of the other things you get back because you don't have to commute somewhere as a, as a robot, you know, five days a week, <laughs> is you get your time back. Um, and I found it being here, even, I mean, I still go to meetings and workshops here. I find going into the office for those far more stimulating because it's almost like an adventure. 
Yeah. I'm going into the office. I'm going to see some people. We're going to go and do this stuff. So now I'm energized. Whereas, you know, if I think back to my days in the office, five days a week, you know, by Thursday, you're exhausted from commuting and, you know, being on back to back calls and all the rest of it. Now you want to go do a workshop. I'm not in a good state to do a workshop. I'm thinking about the 10 things I want to get done before I go, you know, before the, the weekend. And now you're going to try and get me to be creative for two hours. And I'm, all I'm thinking about is if I don't get the stuff done, my weekend's kind of be screwed because I'm going to catch up over the weekend. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, that's been good too, um, in the sense of giving you more, more control over your time. Yeah, and that's higher order value work, right? Because when you do very intensive thing, for example, when you do a, a consulting exercise and you have to just write the report, pretty much sometimes it takes me seven hours in a room to just represent that in the right fashion. So it's a higher thinking, critical thinking. On the contrary, yeah. I'm also seeing few startups or companies who are kind of creating digital avatar to transform industry. And the recent example is, fashion industry where the fashion industry couldn't come to work at one place because that's how they used to work for ages and recently they decided that we'll have a fashion show which will be um done by avatars of real models like tommy hilfiger and stuff they they be yes, yes, in the yes. space of technology and imagine the people who are designing they are doing higher order four hours or four days work and that is getting consumed on a platform where these people necessarily not be there, but they can be with their family. However, it can generate a lot of revenue yeah. and become scalable. Yes. No, and, and that's the thing. We, we, I mean, if, if, so if you look at the future now, we're, we're what, 2021. Mm-hmm. If you look at the next 10 years, how do you think the world's going to go? I mean, do you think we're going to carry on the way we're going now with people being enable to work remotely and get the job done? Or do you think we're going to go to this hybrid model, which some people talk about as kind of the best of the, uh, the best of the new world with, with, the, with the, the anchor of the old world? This question needs to be underlined um, with the industry, I would say, right? Um, yeah. So for example, if you look at any industry, there are two type of people who are required. First is front end and second is back end. For example, yeah. If you look at any hospitality industry, the receptionist staff or anyone who's touching customers is a front-end staff. So that's the piece which is under a lot of consideration because that requires empathy. Look at all, both of us. We Machine yep. hardly can remove us even in the next uh, 10 years because when you go to work or do a workshop with customer, you feel them what they're trying to do and stuff like that. That's a higher order human effect which will not change. Um, now come back to the back end stuff where people can share and support remotely. And that's the work which will become more and more remote in nature. And the good example in education industry, if you look at, um, uh, for me, teacher is very important, but uh, I'll give you an example. I myself, I'm going to Wharton uh, for the next nine months, but I can't okay. go physically. Yeah, I've got in, enrolled into a CTO leadership program, but I'm going to do that program remotely for eight months and then towards the end I will go in person. And mm. I feel that's a higher order value for me and the industry and the institution like Wharton because they can scale themselves. They are able to reach to more people. And those are the models in the industry where I would not say back end, but a lot of stuff can be done remotely and it can be a mix of hybrid, as you said. So every industry yeah. will. Uh, look at front end, back end, they will look at hybrid and um, remote and they will come up with a model which can be defined for sure. I mean, technically, you know, we can define a model of anywhere workspace and how things should connect uh, because yes. at then accessing applications. So that's not hard, but it's a question on every organization how they want to change. Yeah, and I think there's there, there is the old school, new school thing as well. There's, there's, it's the organization is made up of the people and the people inside the organization need to be willing to change. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's where, uh, you know, personally I've seen it with, with people I've worked with where they don't want to, they don't want to change from this. You need to be in the office five days a week because that's how they're comfortable. Um, yeah. It almost doesn't matter. The better, better work is done, you know, in, in other ways. Yeah, and that is becoming hard to do unless we are able to explain to people why they should change. And which is good yeah. in a way that not often change is good. Right? I'll give you an example. Yeah. Historically, if you look at uh, bank tailors, so they were 
um, ledgers and pens and rulers where people used to write, which was good in a way because we had more um, accountable roles. And now we started to move that with technology to a point that today you have a fintech which just runs on crypto. However, both of us know that <laughs> how secure and how safe and how um, reliable crypto can be, given the fact that you're looking at changing the whole bank into crypto. So the question is, do you really need to change? And that's a big question where someone has to think through in, in deeply the cause and effect of change, I would say. Yeah, look, I mean, crypto is, is an interesting space on its own. Uh, I think one of the challenges with, with it is, is it disrupts so, so many fundamental things. That's the, the weight of the naysayers who are impacted by that. And I'm talking about the, the JP Morgan's, the UBS's, the whatever that have said, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the background, they're building their own chains yeah. and they're investing in chains just to, just so they're ready for it. And at some point they'll switch over. I think that's where it gets, um, I don't want to say political, but, but it does get nuanced. Yeah. Every, every change I, I read history a bit, and I felt there were three things of a triangle which were important for a change. Uh, the first was technology. The second edge of uh, triangle was economy. And the third was governance. For example, yeah. when autonomous car came to a few countries in Europe, um, the autonomous car could actually run at a high speed. But the governments didn't allow by their governance law that autonomous car should run on um, the fastest highways on the in the world, and what happened? Autonomous car went back technically, and then the government is really looking after ten years that hey, we should actually look at um, making the whole world autonomous. So, I think the technology, economy, and governance the three part of a triangle which often doesn't connect together. <laughs> no, you're so right. It doesn't. It's 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 a, an ambition more than a, a reality sometimes. I mean, if anyone wants to get, get in contact with you, what would be the best way to to reach you? Yeah, regarding the book, my publishers have hosted a website called prashantpandeofficial.com. Um, okay. On that uh, website, my email ID, my phone number is there. At the same time, there is a option where people can just write me a note and I'm reachable. Okay. Fantastic. And are you going to um, be doing any book launches, any webinars on your book? that anyone should know about? Um, thanks, um, uh, Brian. I'm, I'm planning a launch somewhere around 23rd of November. Um, okay, and the reason to, Yeah, so uh, someone like you who, who perhaps will read the book will have an opinion, an option. I'm invited to, I'm very excited to invite them so they can come, share their learning, and then we have a celebration of that and we continue from there on so that we can share more goodness around. So 23rd November is the date which is there in my mind and I have to prepare for that. Fantastic. Awesome. Super. Um, well, thank you very much for giving up your time to be on the podcast and, and I wish you well with the launch of your book. Likewise, um, Rian, I mean, my, it was my pleasure talking to you and I look forward to listening to your podcast. All the best. Great, thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.